Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, talk to you about um, political astuteness and argue that it's a really important skill for public managers to have, particularly at more senior levels, but actually at all levels uh, in public organisations. And so I'm going to look at this rather indefinite thing that we've got a whole set of words to try and describe what it is that makes some public managers uh, quite, quite savvy, if you like, or quite good at uh, dealing with uh, a number of complex situations, uh, and other people much less so. And it's interesting that the literature hasn't really settled on a particular uh, terminology yet, though I'm going to argue <coughs> for political astuteness. And I want to use this to think about uh, a sense of um, uh, savvy about politics, not just the big P politics of the formal institutions and actors of the state, uh, working with ministers and so on, uh, but also the informal politics that we all know goes on within organisations and between partners and so on, and thinking about the diverse interests that uh, lead leaders have to navigate. So that's what I'm going to uh, concentrate on, big P but also small P politics. And I was very interested to see that the New Zealand Department of Transport is already on to this, so they're talking about savvy uh, as an important capability uh, for uh, public managers. So I'm going to do two things. Uh, one is I'm going to, first of all, just briefly describe wh uh, what I mean by politically astute leadership. And then I'm going to go on to look at a, a particular context, which is uh, working with elected politicians. Uh, and by the way, I should say that this is work I've done with a, a number of great colleagues, one of whom is sitting in the room, uh, John Alford. Um, I'm going to draw on three major studies that I've undertaken. One, looking at political astuteness across the public, private and voluntary sectors. Then a, a three country study which just focused in on the public sector, and that's where I'm, I guess I'm most interested. Uh, and a third study which looked at our, our very, uh, uh, our most senior um, public servants in the UK, permanent secretaries and chief executives in local government. Um, so the, the study I'll draw on particularly is the one of uh, Australia, New Zealand and the UK. Uh, but I want to emphasise that I'm not just talking about civil servants, I'm talking about people who work in local government, people who work in police, in prisons, in the health service, anybody who works in a, a public service job. Now, uh, I think for quite a long while, uh, the idea of politics and public managers didn't mix at all. In fact, across all sectors, the view was that politics was uh, uh, dysfunctional, illegitimate, nefarious, devious, uh, and so on. And there's any number of uh, writings w w that one can draw on that actually express that particular view. But I want to propose, and we've got good research evidence behind us, that in fact uh, uh, politics in people's work as a manager, I don't mean the formal uh, political system, uh, is, can actually be used in very constructive ways. And where this links into leadership is thinking about leadership as having to mobilise attention, people, resources across diverse interests. Far too much of the leadership literature still focuses on shared goals. And sometimes there can be shared goals, but sometimes, there are, sometimes those goals are shared, sometimes they're competing. Anybody who's had to work in a partnership arrangement will know that there's sometimes uh, di diverse and sometimes competing goals. Similarly for a public manager working with a minister and so on. So I want to focus on that bit about diverse and competing interests. And thinking of political skill as actually being able to understand, anticipate, interpret uh, and think about those diverse interests and act in ways uh, to, um, to take that into account and to use that in a very constructive way for social, uh, organisational and public value outcomes. 
Now, this doesn't rule out what we sometimes call a more Machiavellian view of politics, which is it can be used in a uh, uh, nefarious way, and that's obviously present too. Uh, but I want to fo focus particularly on the constructive side of it. And in fact, our managers, uh, who were all senior managers, a small number of middle managers, actually agreed with us that uh, politics in their work as a manager actually was about building alliances, scanning the external environment, working with formal institutions and processes of, um, of uh, government. Uh, it was much less about uh, uh, defending your own turf or self-interest, uh, career interest, and so on. Now, you might say that the people who filled in our questionnaire were being very devious in the way that they replied to this. But uh, the questionnaire was anonymous. And also, from our interviews, we know that people talked about political skill and political astuteness in a very constructive, a very thoughtful way in trying to deal with quite complex uh, problems and issues that they encountered in the workplace. So if there's uh, one thing I'd like you to take away is the idea of thinking about political astuteness as potentially a very um, positive and potentially uh, constructive aspect uh, or skill <coughs> that public managers um, uh, can have. It's not inevitable, but it quite often is. Uh, and as part of the work, we built a framework uh, we used a survey, 50 items in the survey, and built up a very detailed picture of what constitutes political astuteness uh, across five dimensions, from understanding yourself uh, through understanding others and their interests and their goals and their values through to understanding the, understanding the strategic context. Uh, I'm not going to go into that any further because I want to go on to think a little bit about one particular stakeholder that um, politically astute managers and leaders need to, uh, may need to work with is elected politicians. And um, I think the particular challenges for public managers and political astuteness is on the one hand, they're having to work in political organizations, public services, um, institutions of the state, which are inherently political. We appoint elected politicians. Um, uh, the issues are often very contested and so on. Brexit, the National Health Service and so on. So very uh, contested. Um, we have to work in that environment. But on the other hand, particularly those who work in Westminster systems, uh, found in lots of Anglo-Saxon countries, they're expected to be politically neutral. They mustn't get involved in party politics. So how do public uh, managers navigate the tensions between those two uh, sets of forces uh, on them? And I'm going to look at that briefly by looking at uh, work we did uh, on how public managers worked with elected politicians. So I'm going to look at um, uh, some uh, issues about how they talked about using political astuteness as they worked with uh, elected politicians. Now, in our research, we asked people about whether they felt there was a line or a zone between their work and elected politicians. Because there's a large literature which says that elected politicians, they do the policy work and uh, managers uh, do the implementation and that there should be clear blue water between them or at least a line which mustn't be crossed. And there's a whole literature called the politics administration dichotomy uh, that some of you may be familiar with. Actually, calling public managers administrators really irritates me because they're often dealing with very, very complex uh, issues and it's demeaning to say that they're simply doing administration. But anyway, that's the, that's the uh, literature, the, the dichotomy, and a view that um, uh, there is a line which shouldn't be crossed. A, a number of commentators are saying, well, that line does get crossed in practice, but I think what we've tried to do in this work is change the metaphor from a line to a zone. And I'll explain that in just a moment. Because in our interviews, people said that um, uh, it, was, uh, it was much more blurred 
So we came up with the idea of a purple zone. I don't know if some of you have seen this uh, uh, paper that we wrote, where there's the red of politics, there's the blue of uh, administration or management, but actually one fades into the other. And the whole idea of, of the whole concept of a, um, uh, uh, a zone is that it's an area of transition. So our public managers said that they sometimes entered into the zone of working with um, elected uh, politicians, sometimes doing similar work with them, using these political astuteness skills to help, help politicians define problems, look at policy options, work out how to implement things, uh, rescue implementation when things went uh, pear-shaped and so on. And they said they really needed those political astuteness skills. So we've got this idea of a, a zone rather than a line, and we feel that's quite a contribution to the literature. And, um, but that idea of a line does still exist. The line might exist in situations which are quite predictable, relatively simple, and so on, but not so much. People talked about a zone when it was complex or contested, uh, uh, or uh, where a minister w perhaps wouldn't step into their <coughs> space, the public manager needed to move in, in that area, and so on. And also the quality of, of the actual relationship. I think the other thing is that we looked at this through the lens of leadership. So we didn't look, just look at it in terms of functions and, or roles, mm -hmm. but in terms of a negotiated order uh, using ideas from uh, leadership. And in fact, we also drew on the idea of a, uh, we've got a metaphor of a zone. We also have a metaphor of dancing on ice. And this is the idea that actually, uh, this is a report I wrote with Stella Manzi. Um, this is the idea that actually, when you consider the elected politician and the manager, they're often working very closely together on a slippery surface with uh, in the spotlight, often in the media spotlight, and actually they are co-dependent on each other. If one of them stumbles, then uh, uh, the, other, um, the other may also uh, falter. So it's a much more delicate, symbiotic, interdependent uh, relationship. I think I'm, so I think it's uh, goodbye, uh, yes, minister, that idea that's based on formal roles, and much more. Hello, uh, Torval and Dean. So I'm going to finish with this slide, which is to now use that to reflect on the literature on dual leadership. Now, it's interesting, uh, John and Barbara this morning said they only found four papers, which I think which were around uh, dual leadership in their, in their survey. And similarly, I have found very little in the literature around this idea of leadership in the duality at the strategic <coughs> apex of a public organization. Um, so there's, there's relatively little, and yet it's very prevalent in large parts of um, the public sector. Vice Chancellor and Registrar, uh, Minister and Permanent Secretary, uh, Leader and Chief Executive. So why aren't we studying this more? And I think we can look at this, and political astuteness is one way uh, into that. We need to understand the different roles, but it's much more about a negotiated order. And uh, importantly, the managers in our uh, research have said that that political astuteness is really important for them uh, in uh, working with elected members in this dual leadership role, uh, and it helps them particularly in the zone. They actually need political astuteness to know how or to assess how far they should move into that zone and how far to stay within their own distinctive um, area. This is not to argue against the importance and value of technical skills, technical knowledge that public managers have. But this is saying technical knowledge plus political astuteness uh, is, is where you get effective public leadership. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.